we had a number of classic third-party risk cases. It was like almost a time warp where we went back and went to, let's say, oil and gas cases from years and years ago where valuable agents, third-party agents with connections to foreign officials were paid high commissions as a way to funnel and fund bribery schemes. We didn't have sophisticated, let's say, use of distributors and discount schemes, rebates, whatever, to fund those bribery schemes. Here, it was more blatant than that. It was just paying a lot of money to these third-party agents. And then when they succeeded, they were rewarded with huge payments. Global companies face unprecedented risks and challenges in today's economy. To mitigate these legal and economic risks, companies are rapidly embracing and elevating the importance of robust ethics and compliance programs to promote positive corporate citizenship. On Corruption, Crime, and Compliance, you'll hear from industry leaders and insiders about how to create effective ethics and compliance programs that will mitigate risks and maximize financial performance. Here's your host, Michael Volkov. Welcome to Corruption, Crime, and Compliance. Today, we're going to do a FCPA review for 2023, an interesting year, to say the least. And we've gotten off to 2024 with a sort of fast start with the SAP case, which we talked about last week. But let's take a look at 2023 as a whole, and let me try to identify some significant events and some trends that I think we're going to see continue into 2024. Overall, 2023 was a slow enforcement year for the Justice Department. I would call it a steady enforcement year for the SEC. And the enforcement actions definitely underscored some important compliance trends and issues, I think, that are good reminders for everybody. But also, 2023, DOJ has definitely elevated compliance expectations for a number of areas, not just FCPA or anti-corruption but in other areas as well, including sanctions and overall white collar crime type of issues. So like I said, DOJ was slow, SEC was steady, individual criminal prosecutions were down. And that is probably the most significant event that occurred. It was significantly down. We had no corporate monitors that were signed this year. And we also had Congress stepping in and enacting the Foreign Extortion Prevention Act to get at the ban side bribery prosecutions. Now, do I think that's going to have a big impact? That's a 15-year offense, zero to 15 years as being the maximum. And money laundering, I think, will continue to be charged against foreign officials. And that's a 20-year offense. So we may see additional charges, but no real significant impact. On the DOJ side, we saw six entities prosecuted, eight individuals, and then there were two declinations. On the SEC side, we had nine entities charged, and the CFTC had one being free point at the end of the year. The total fines and penalties for the entire year totaled $818 million, which was much less than 2022, which was almost $1.4 billion total, DOJ and SEC. No major blockbuster cases, no cases, like I said, with the appointment of corporate compliance monitors. We had two declinations, Corsicol and LifeCor. Corsicol was a $1.2 million disgorgement. LifeCor, 406000 disgorgement. The two biggest cases, I think, from the DOJ side were Albemarle, which we'll talk about, and Erickson's DPA, Deferred Prosecution Breach, SEC's uh, two biggest cases, I think, Albemarle and Phillips. Phillips being the medical imaging company. When you look at total corporate fines, like I said, it was a down year and it's been a down year. 2021 was really slow. 2022 was a little bit higher because of Glencore at 1.4 million and 2023 was 800 some million and a slower year in general. Like I said, there were no top 10 corporate settlements. One of the real interesting developments was a decline in individual criminal prosecutions. I can't really give you an explanation for why. You know, we had the pandemic year, so we only had 12 individual criminal prosecutions, three of which were re-indictments. One was to move jurisdictions from the Eastern District of New York to Texas, and two others were re-indictments after the judge had dismissed the cases. Now, the other individual criminal prosecution trend that was interesting to sort of monitor was 
the Tysers Wood UK reinsurance case and the Free Point corporate prosecutions, they followed a number of individual indictments that were brought and a corporate declination in the Tysers Wood case. Then they brought the prosecution of the entities. I thought that was an interesting pattern because it's really supposed to work the other way where you get a company that comes in, company cooperates, provides information, and then that leads to the prosecution of individuals. It's a weird situation, and it may reflect the fact that DOJ had less number of cases, a fewer number of cases, and therefore had to sort of mine some cases that they had already to go back and charge the entities. I'm not sure. But then again, you know, we hear that there are 90 pending FCPA investigations, so who knows? But the number of prosecutions went down, like I said, to 12. The height was 34 in 2019. 2020 went down probably because of the pandemic. 2021 was at 26 cases and 2022 was lower. I expected this number to keep increasing, particularly with DOJ's stated goal of increasing individual prosecutions in general and using corporations to go after individuals. So what were the top lessons learned and the key takeaways? And I'd probably put them into four categories. We had a number of classic third-party risk cases. It was like almost a time warp where we went back and went to, let's say, oil and gas cases from years and years ago where valuable agents, third-party agents with connections to foreign officials were paid high commissions as a way to funnel and fund bribery schemes. We didn't have sophisticated, let's say, use of distributors and discount schemes, rebates, whatever, to fund those bribery schemes. Here, it was more blatant than that. It was just paying a lot of money to these third-party agents. And then when they succeeded, they were rewarded with huge payments. This also then underscored my second theme, which is the lack of third-party controls and enforcement. That means that the contract or purchase order to invoice to purchase order payment tinkers to chance, I call it, systems were not in place. And if they were, they were never followed. Number three, third trend, senior executive complicity. And that definitely is true. We have combination of situations where the senior executives knew about it, but had deniability and they didn't do anything about it. Or we also have a few cases here where the senior executives were intimately involved, aware of it and went along with it. Last trend is the unsupported internal audit functions. In other words, weak internal audit support where they would identify problems. They even in one case, Clear Channel didn't get any support or didn't get any cooperation from the entity they were trying to audit. And where was the board? Where was their enforcement? There also was a lack of enforcement as to remediation and findings by internal audit. Well, if the internal audit isn't backed up, then it's obvious to see that things are going to continue as is. And that's what happened in a number of cases. So let's talk about a couple of the highlighted cases. I'm not going to go through every case that occurred in this podcast, but we do have a recording of a full webinar on going through case by case, which is on the YouTube Volkoff Law channel, which has a lot of compliance webinars free and available for your viewing. So the Erickson Deferred Prosecution Agreement breach. This was a pretty big case because in 2019, Erickson entered into a three-year deferred prosecution agreement to resolve FCPA charges for $1 billion for bribery schemes in Djibouti, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Kuwait. And in 2021, Erickson notified DOJ that it breached the DPA by violating cooperation and disclosure provisions. In other words, they omitted information about Djibouti and China, and they had possible violations, and this was the incendiary part, in Iraq involving payments that were made to ISIS for transporting equipment across ISIS-controlled areas for purposes of building cell phone systems. Now, Erickson, as a result of this, was required to plead guilty to a two-count information for conspiracy to one, bribe, and number two, violate books and records. And they paid an additional $206 million. The corporate monitorship they were under was extended and they were placed on probation, which gives the judge more sort of ability to come in and remedy problems if they should arise. And the CEO and the chief compliance officer 
were required to submit compliance attestations at the completion. Now, one of the things that was highlighted in the Erickson case, and this is a little bit of inside baseball, was internal investigation nightmare scenarios. In other words, now apparently the law firm, and it's a big name law firm that was involved in this, has been accused of withholding information deliberately and knowingly and being investigated as well. So the internal investigation nightmare really came upon the failure to disclose involving those lawyers outside counsel and senior executives. I don't know exactly what the nature of the investigation is with regard to the outside counsel, but I can imagine that this is something that's not pleasant. What was found, number one, was a May 2011 email, which was in Italian, that confirmed the knowledge of two senior executives from Ericsson in the Jubati bribery scheme. That was not disclosed until a new law firm basically was brought in and they found this and unfortunately led to a disclosure which caused the breach. And then there was a 2018 email which raised concerns of China's senior executive involvement in bribery, which outside counsel failed to produce for over three years when new outside counsel was retained. There also was a basement, I like to call it the basement, large number of hard copy documents, all dealing with third parties and third party contracts, which were not searched nor produced and were known to senior executives and outside counsel and nonetheless never reviewed. For people who are involved in investigations, this is why you have to be thorough, why you have to go through everything, and why you have to be transparent with the Justice Department. So let's go on. That was one real interesting case. And I wanted to sort of highlight some of the other themes by looking at a couple of other cases. Rio Tinto was an SEC settlement for $15 million. And this is a perfect example of the third-party risk that we're talking about. They paid illegal bribes to a senior Ghana official to secure or reacquire mining rights in various regions. And they retained a consultant with ties to the senior Ghanaian official responsible for mining rights. They attended the same school in Paris. Well, the red flags involved were pretty obvious. The consultant sought $10.5 million for payment for four months' work, and the consultant was paid $3.5 million contingent on retention of specific mining rights. Obviously, these are just means by which to pass through the bribes to the Canadian official. I want to talk about another case, Phillips, which I mentioned was a significant SEC case, I think, $62 million for a China bribery scheme. And this was the second SEC FCPA settlement in the last 10 years for Phillips. In 2013, Phillips had to pay $4.5 million for bribery payments in Poland. One thing that's interesting to me is I don't understand why the Justice Department declined in this case, but apparently they did. And with the Justice Department's sort of push on recidivism and tough talk on recidivism, I don't understand why they didn't sort of get involved in this case. So from 2014 to 2019, the bribery scheme was executed through distributors and it was funded by discounts. This was the only case that had a sort of that classic formulation. And the bribes were paid in exchange for Phillips favored technical specifications that were included in tenders. They also did fake competitive bids, which were submitted by cooperative distributors and sub dealers to meet China's three bidding rules. In China, tender rules require three bidders before a contract can be awarded, and they put in fake competitive bids in that case. Let's go on to another case, which was 3M. 3M paid the SEC $6.5 million. 3M did not have a good year. They had a big OFAC case, and they had a big SEC bribery case. But this one is just an important reminder on your gifts, meals, and entertainment. 3M funneled bribes through elaborate schemes to benefit Chinese state-owned officials, with overseas travel and hospitality for alleged educational and healthcare facility events. And the scheme here was pretty blatant. The 3M marketing manager used two Chinese-based travel agencies to arrange overseas travel and events. The China staff then sent fake itineraries to the 3M's compliance department for approval. These itineraries actually were fake and they disguised tourist travel as alleged educational and facility visits. In fact, one of the events was highlighted because it was provided in English and it turned out some of the attendees who supposedly were going to these alleged events did not speak English. 
that was obviously a failure to connect certain facts. So the China staff circulated then the real itineraries to Chinese government officials through WeChat communications. And during 2014 to 2018, 3M conducted basically 24 of these fake events at a cost of $1 million for hospitality purposes. And the events were illegally funded through inflated invoices submitted by the Chinese travel agencies. It was down to the point where 3M looked at how much money, additional revenue they made because of the bribery payments. They paid a million dollars and then they earned 3.5 million in additional revenue. Interesting. The biggest case was definitely Albemarle for the year, DOJ and the SEC for $218 million. It's an interesting case in a number of respects. Albemarle, which is a specialty chemicals company, entered into a non-prosecution agreement, not a deferred prosecution, a non-prosecution agreement, which means there's no filing with any court. It's just between you and the Justice Department, you and the SEC, for bribes paid in Vietnam, Indonesia, and India. Now, DOJ discounted the penalty because Albemarle withheld executive bonuses, so they had clawbacks, and they credited a portion of those clawbacks against the penalty, and they also credited a large portion of the SEC penalty of $103 million. So between 2009 and 2017, Albemarle paid bribes, and again, through third-party sales agents to secure valuable chemical catalyst contracts at state-owned refineries in Vietnam, Indonesia, and India. And interestingly, DOJ awarded a 45% discount from the bottom of the sentencing guideline range, which was a big, big discount. And I think they were trying to make a point here in terms of offering higher discounts to encourage people to voluntarily disclose. But Albemarle's third parties. And its road to the non-prosecution agreement. First, they relied on third parties, often based on inadequate to non-existent due diligence, a lack of written contracts, and excessive payments to third parties to fund bribery payments. The third party in Vietnam, for example, requested an increase in commissions from 4.5 to 6.5 percent. And remember, these are large contracts, so that would make a big difference. And the third party in Indonesia told Albemarle officials he needed an increase in commissions to pay bribes to Pertamina officials in Indonesia, but Albemarle officials just sat there on their hands and never reported the statement and continued forward with the business. In India, third parties pay bribes from relatively high commission of 3%. Now, Albemarle did not earn the full benefit of voluntary disclosure because it waited 16 months before the initial disclosure of bribery conduct in Vietnam, but they earned a lot, a lot of positive and the discount here from extensive remediation, which included they began remediation before DOJ even learned of the investigation. They disciplined a number of employees, 11 were terminated and withheld bonuses from 16. They restructured their business operations to reduce reliance on third parties, and they implemented data analytics and continuous monitoring and audit programs. So an interesting case that's definitely worth looking at as you go along. So I wanted to just highlight the significant cases. And again, if you want to listen to a case-by-case description, go to the YouTube channel for Volkoff Law, and we have compliance webinars there. And And the webinar we held earlier this year is available there. I mentioned the Foreign Extortion Prevention Act was passed that amended the domestic bribery statute to include foreign officials among those who are prohibited from soliciting, demanding, or receiving bribes. Like I said, it's a 15-year offense, and prosecutors are still likely to use money laundering along with that. In addition, we saw revisions this year to the corporate enforcement policy, and basically, even if they're aggravating circumstances, you can still earn up to 75% off or even up to 50% off if there's no voluntary disclosure. And we saw what happened with Albemarle in terms of them earning a 45% discount. We also saw this year the issuance of the evaluation of corporate compliance programs. And we saw the creation of a compliance-based compliance compensation system requirement with clawbacks and other things that we're all interested in. And 
we saw some revisions to the consequence management guidelines, which have been sort of carrying us forward in terms of the evaluation factors of compliance programs. We also saw a broad mandate for data sharing so that HR departments need to cooperate closely with chief compliance officers in sharing data and sharing information. In addition to that, Obviously, I mentioned the DOJ's focus on compensation programs, but we also had some focus on ephemeral messaging systems and data preservation and the requirements to preserve your business records and policies and procedures governing your bring your own device tools and making sure that you don't lose all of this data that can then be relevant for an internal investigation. And finally, we had a new FCPA merger and acquisition policy, which basically set up new post-closing deadlines. You have post-closing to earn part of a safe harbor for, let's say, earning a declination for past behavior. Past misconduct is six months to your initial disclosure, 12 months to remediate it. And those deadlines can then be relaxed depending on the complexity, but certainly something that is really positive development in the merger and acquisition space. And you need to, let me emphasize this, conduct post-integration audits. That's the key to access this. Well, that's a quick summary of 2023. Again, go to our YouTube channel and you will be able then to watch a full blow-by-blow review of each of the cases if you're interested in a more extensive discussion. But thanks again. And next week, we're going to have a review of OFAC and DOJ's sanctions enforcement for 2023 as well. Thanks again. See you next week. If you enjoyed this episode, the best way to support the show is by subscribing on your favorite listening platform. To learn more and connect with Michael Volkov, go to VolkovLaw.com. 